Hi, my name is Nishe, and this is going to be a deep dive into the wacky world of psychedelics and capitalism. It's somewhat a reaction to some videos I've seen recently put out by Rebel Wisdom, which is one of the only cultural hubs affiliated with the psychedelic community um, that is putting out regular content online right now. And surprisingly, they skew somewhat conservative, and I have some critiques of a few of their positions, so I'm going to offer them here. So if you haven't heard of Rebel Wisdom, it is a um, online media company that puts together in-person conferences and workshops. But um, so you can go to rebelwisdom.co.uk. I will link it down below to check them out. And according to their vision, they say, in these times of change, we can no longer trust the traditional media to make sense of the world. The old gatekeepers are losing their power. A new counterculture is filling the void, driven by a great intellectual awakening. Facilitated by new technology, it's made a new kind of conversation possible, more in depth, more open, and more democratic. Rebel Wisdom is a media platform founded by BBC and Channel 4 filmmaker David Fuller and co-founded by writer Alexander Biner. It's centered on the conviction that we are seeing a civilizational level crisis of ideas as the old operating system breaks down. The new is struggling to emerge and the most transformative ideas always show up first as rebellious. So I actually originally came across Rebel Wisdom because I was looking for some interesting left-leaning critiques of Jordan Peterson because I was seeing that a lot of the coverage of him was being very simplistic and that he was introducing some really inter exploring some really interesting ideas and I wasn't seeing a lot of nuanced critique of him and I found a really interesting conversation about Jordan Peterson some, some years ago now um, by the folks at Rebel Wisdom. And um, I kind of fell out of watching them re until recently when I came across, um, they had an online post-COVID Rebel Wisdom festival of ideas with a bunch of different speakers. So the speech that really kicked off my interest in responding was a conversation between Douglas Rushkoff, who is a um, countercultural thinker and kind of technologist, futurist speculator, really interesting guy with a range of ideas. And he was speaking with Jamie Wheel. I'll just go ahead and read his bio, which is listed with his uh, talent speaking agency website. So it says uh, his bio, he's the author of the global bestseller and Pulitzer Prize nominated Stealing Fire, how Silicon Valley, Navy SEALs and Maverick scientists are revolutionizing the way we live and work. He's also the founder of the Flow Genome Project, an international organization dedicated to the research and training of ultimate human performance. And Jamie makes a lot of his money working with top level athletes, but also capitalists, plutocrats, folks that have lots of money and are trying to become even richer. So he's an interesting figure because he's trying to use the insights offered by altered states of consciousness to empower capitalists to be better capitalists. And even on this talent uh, website where, with his bio, there's a quote from a senior partner at Goldman Sachs who says, Jamie blew us away. Our whole group has talked of nothing else this week. Some of the most provocative and disruptive ideas I've heard in a long while. And that's exactly what we need more of here. Here being Goldman Sachs. So I just have to ask, like, is Goldman Sachs the target audience for psychedelic insights? Certainly not for me and the other folks at Symposia. And so I just wanted to kind of look more deeply about into this question of how you end up marshalling psychedelic insights in order to justify furthering the status quo. So I was listening to this conversation between Jamie and Doug Rushkoff, and I was I thought it was interesting that from my listening, it was as if they 
we're actually talking about very different ideas from almost incompatible perspectives, but you wouldn't really know it from watching them. They, they nodded their heads and said, yeah, absolutely, and agreed with each other. So if you're like listening, overhearing the conversation, you would assume that they were saying compatible, similar things. But I've listened to the talk now a few times and I, I just don't come to that conclusion. And the, part of the reason I wanted to go into all of this is that Rebel Wisdom has this very big intellectual dark web interest. So the IDW, for those of you who don't know about it, is affiliated with folks like Jordan Peterson, but a range, a constellation really of different thinkers who ultimately kind of were united around things like a, a hesitancy to be policed by social justice warriors and having a problem with like PC culture and feeling that it was limiting free speech and the free exchange of ideas. And so you can see why some of that vibe would be interesting to uh, folks who are also interested in psychedelics and, you know, kind of questioning established narratives about reality and perception and motivation and selfhood. But there are a lot of really status quo bolstering ideas in the IDW. And so this conversation offers a sneak peek into what the psychology of this sort of IDW slash psychedelic take on transforming culture is. So both Jamie and Doug present themselves as folks who were in the psychedelic community adjacent to, connected to, before the psychedelic renaissance blew up in the mainstream in the past few years and venture capital and all that fun stuff has been pouring into the space. Um, and Jamie has even done a separate talk, this was a year ago, published by Rebel Wisdom called Is the Psychedelic Renaissance Doomed? As, speaking as someone who saw it kind of before it was cool and coming into this new mainstream space. So he's positioning himself as someone who is able to commentate on the state of things in the psychedelic community and the relationship between psychedelics and social change. I'm going to show some clips in a second, but for the meantime, both Doug and Jamie have really radically different views about the major barriers to initiating social change from within the psychedelic community. On Doug's part, he feels like there's a danger in there being these mythological hero narratives that become kind of this abstracted focus that um, is really separate from doing real world practical efforts in the here and now. Whereas for Jamie, he believes, seems to believe from what he's been saying in a few of his talks that there are some kind of very privileged folks switched on psychedelic people that are not able to work together because of weird game theory, interpersonal dynamics. And so he's interested in how do you deconstruct those dynamics um, such that these kind of psychedelic superheroes can work and gel better together and implement their ideas in the world in a practical way. Jamie uses this language that is common on the folks in the scene of Rebel Wisdom. They talk about game A versus game B dynamics. And just in a super simplified sense, game A is this kind of competitive, um, you know, rush to the bottom of the barrel dynamic that they see as behind the current capitalist system. And they envision moving towards a game B dynamic that's based more on cooperation and trust. And so this problematic of moving everyone societally from game A to game B is happening at a microscopic scale or interpersonal scale between these switched on psychedelic superheroes who are having trouble trusting each other enough to get along and do the good work. So here's an excerpt from Jamie Wheel. And I think we've all been having in this, you know, on Rebel Wisdom and elsewhere, you know, which is why is it that people that are sourcing from that place tend as a rule not to play well with others? Yeah. And how the hell do we actually bomb this together? And one of it, it feels like, because because up until now, the waking up process or the actualizing process has been largely individual. 
and catch as catch can. So we're all like apex predators, like panthers, and we all need 400 square miles of territory. And you try and put, you know, you put a dozen panthers in a pen together and it's a shit show, you know, versus if you guys saw that documentary Blackfish, right, about, about orca pods, like they've, they've got bigger brains than we do and that the, all the extra folds are for social coherence. So they literally have anatomically, they are hardwired to, they are apex predators too, the wolves of the sea, they're badasses, but some, they have figured out how to play this game. And so for me, that's the true missing link. And, and I mean, lots of efforts in the last five years of coming together with smart, brilliant intention, you know, like Dharma holders or whatever, they've all got their superpower and the superheroes cannot get it fucking done. In that clip, if you notice the attendee who is vigorously nodding along with Jamie's discussion of psychedelic folks as apex predators, you can imagine my confusion when I didn't resonate at all with the kinds of issue that he was describing. My experience working with Symposia has been actually the complete opposite of the game theory dynamics that he's saying are universal amongst these switched on psychedelic leader types. And it made me want to look more into like, who are these people that he's actually describing? Am I crazy to think that this isn't universal? Like, why does everyone seem to think this is normal? And I started getting some insights as I kept watching. But I've been noticing particularly around communities of practice that are thinking of these kinds of things and are trying to explore the way into collective coherence and ways for us to play better together. Is there's this consistent and sort of, I don't know what you'd call it, sad, frustrating, concerning, but it's a, it's a pattern that seems to come up, which is that folks are uh, discussing these ideas and concepts. They are realizing, yes, game A, Ooh, game B, yay, you, you think the same things, we say we, we, we're believing the same beliefs, uh, let's get together and play. And there is often an initial spike of enthusiasm, excitement, uh, feeling met, um, and a sense of, holy shit, maybe this is how we get this done, right? Collaboration. And then we get to this place where we find our nominal allies, our nominal conspirators, those who breathe together. And there's often a spike of optimism, euphoria, possibility. And then we get to this stutter step where it's like, wait a second, if we're really going to do this post-egoic thing, if we're really going to dump all of our puzzle pieces out that we've been carrying so carefully, right, and mix them all in together, and holy shit, maybe there's even a bigger picture that none of us had, but our puzzle pieces fit together beautifully. Um, wait, wait a second, am I sure? And we see somebody do something that we're like, I'm not a thousand percent sure that was quite right. We see money, power, influence, control. What do we do on Monday morning, right? Who gets the credit? Who strokes the check, right? <laughs> who gets the likes? Who gets the post? You know, who gets the funding? Who gets the peer reviewed rights? Whose name is on the, pa on the top of the paper or the book? And suddenly we go back down into the inevitable substrate of game A. Oh, there's always something about those folks that seems like they're on the inside of the secret. And we're drawn to them, we seek them out. We, we, that's who we feel we wanna be with and our people are with. So we find each other and we say, ah, I see your light. Hail fellow, well met, right? Um, and we're drawn to that. And then as we accumulate these error messages and as we go from sort of this mirage of crystallizing infinite game B possibility and then we start seeing oh, maybe shadow, maybe blind spot, maybe ego or pride or contraction, then boom, 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 we go back down the floorboards to seeing each other's shadow from each other's shadow. If somebody says, I'm not convinced we're in it for the same reasons. I'm not convinced that person isn't covertly playing game A dynamics, rivalrous dynamics with game B lip service, effectively the, the covert sociopath. Then I can trust that when I transgress, I will acknowledge it. You don't have to be vigilant. We don't have to be down in that level of you holding onto your shadow, right? Watching out for mine because you trust. 
having been trained in the school of hard knocks rather than Jamie's flow dojo, I'm acutely aware of the presence of narcissists in society and the ways that personality dynamics can sometimes be really problematic and toxic. And increasingly, it started sounding like he was trying to find a way to get people with unresolved, narcissistic or otherwise power-hungry driven folks to play well together and thinking that that was the solution forward. And in order to do that, he comes up with this really uh, complicated solution where everyone in this group of switched on superheroes commits to doing the right thing and being a good person such that you just trust that everyone else there has your back and is on the same page. And any red flags you see, they mean well and they'll take care of it. Trust them. And I'm just not sure about this code of ethics being a way to operate society, whether it's corporations or individuals. And my instinct was definitely, if you're seeing red flags in folks, maybe those people actually have some chip on their shoulder or thing that they're trying to get ahead with. And maybe those are signs that you should red flags, you know, look out for and not just plow ahead, rush ahead with these people. But from Jamie's perspective, since this dynamic is perceived as universal, the idea is that we have to just accept that everyone kind of sucks on one level and remember to focus on the positive. And so one proposed solution would be the idea of like, can we, can we see each other's light from each other's light? right? Without getting pushed away from each other by seeing each other's shadow or fallibility or humanity. Mm -hmm. And so if you find as a thought experiment, like who's your 12, like find your dozen and think about the people that are closest in your life and think about the beautiful, perfect part of them. That is their expression. It could be, they're always the humorous one. They're always the adventuresome one. They're always the emotionally intelligent one. This is the creative harebrained idea. When like, I love you fully and wholly for that in that expression, when you're on that, you are perfect. Right. And that's awesome because we can love each other up. But then there's also the element of, well, hey, rather than some of us getting kind of sort of most of the way there and whether it's pressure from the marketplace or Instagram or whatever, we start fronting that we're all the way there. We actually say, what if we assemble from this dozen that is our carass, right, as Vonnegut would call it, right, our crew, that we say we take your slice of the divine, we take your slice of the divine, this, your slice, your slice, and we assemble Voltron, we assemble perfected human that is the sum total and mediated by all of our relationships, which is we express via agape, like I fucking love you because I see the perfected in you, but none of us grab the ring. That's a non-starter, but between us, we can hold and metabolize perfected human and we can, we can transfer all worship, right? Sacrifice, dedication, loyalty to that hologram that is the one, right? Held and metabolized by the 12. And can we use that as a way to precipitate what Tila de Chardin called the, you know, the Omega point, like the body of Christ, de Chardin said, is the second coming at the end of time that is all of us as Omegans. As you might be able to guess, Doug was not having that. He recognized it as a mythology that's coming in to justify action that is quite abstracted from what's going on on the ground right i don't go to omega but it's, <laughs> it's, it's nice it's nice i mean i guess i don't believe the ring actually has power that was we've got to you know develop more technologies more industry more capitalism and more growth is the only way you know there were to, to to keep this thing going you know, that's what got us in this mess. You know, that's what got us into the into the industrial age and now into what I've been calling digital industrialism, that we're applying digital technology to this scaled industrial age, exponential, market-based, you know, uh, uh, universal solution. And where I get concerned is when those of us who see the fallacy of that approach, when we adopt some of the same language. How are we going to unite 
as a planet, all the people, and figure to take down global capitalism. You know, how are we going to to uh, uh, create the scaled golem to fight the institutional uh, the institutional evil out there? So that uh, uh, we look for scaled universal solutions to these scaled universal problems when. I'm coming to believe that the answer is not scaled universal global solutions at all, but extremely particular local, uh, 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 highly, highly uh, uh, I- individual and distributed solutions. That, that the response to globalism is not a universal revolution, but a highly local thing. You know, the, the, uh, anything universal, as far as I'm concerned, anything universal is, is highly abstracted and divorced from on the ground reality. And the, the kinds of solutions we need are going to be real tiny ones, ones that we probably get no credit for, ones that, uh, you know, th- there's not gonna be a, a book title. But if you remember back to Goldman Sachs, JB's not working with folks who don't want credit for stuff. Uh, just to give you another kind of insight into the people he's used to working with, check out this uh, excerpt from a different conversation he had. How are you guys, by cracking the human genome thing, by teaching people to not have that narcissistic thing, how are you going to turn that into a business? Like, like how are people going to pay for this? Or what's it going to build? Sure. Well, I mean, I think the first thing is just to say who, who's already interested, right? And, and we have been, you know, privileged to be working with, you know, world-class elite performers in virtually every vertical. And that's from hedge funds and financial traders who want to find the edge uh, for, the, for guys moving large amounts of dollars. And it's not unlike the poker players, right, where, where even, even, even a 1% bump in their impact matters. Uh, special operations community. And, you know, same thing. How do, we, how do we put our teams into group flow so in the real time, live fire combat, those mistakes, those mistakes don't happen, and those guys come home alive. Um, you know, leading companies in the tech space, uh, leading companies in even professional and management consulting who are pitching seven and eight figure deals and their ability to read a room, their ability to be to drop into the present moment and their ability to hit that fifth gear instead of grind the gears is going to make the difference. So that's that's the reflections we're already getting back from the marketplace, um, that, they, that basically anybody who is already invested in top 10 percent talent or even top 1 percent talent um, is desperate to stay ahead and, and wants to use these techniques to train and up-level their people. For us as an organization, it's kind of a three-step model. So what the Flow Dojo represents is it's the world's first research and training center for optimal human performance. And once built, what that allows us to do is A, train elite high performers, right? So anybody who's interested in, in becoming, you know, taking their top top 10% and making the top 1% or beyond, um, that's what we will be offering. So high-end, deeply immersive, high-impact trainings, right? So that's step one. As we're doing that, we're gathering data. So what happens with most academic research projects is a couple of fail points. One is they're kind of limited in their sample size, so they have to coax and cajole undergrads and, and you know and, and dirt poor graduate students to come through you know one at a time, ten at a time, etc. And uh, you know their sample sizes end up relatively small versus what could we do with large scale impacts. And the other is you know they scrounge together their research money. They're usually doing it in some dank you know academic basement. That their their tools and their technologies are really limited. They're probably you know put together with bailing wire and duct tape. So our sense is what happens if you up the sample size massively and you have thousands and tens of thousands of people coming through and capturing their data? And what happens if you create an absolute bespoke environment, one that is completely designed top to bottom, right, to precipitate the very states and experiences that, that we believe are of interest? And for us, it's, it's, it's the flow state. Following this train of thought and these conversations Jamie's been having, I thought to myself, there must be some, you know, group of psychedelic superheroes that he is referring to. You know, there's specific people that are having trouble getting the thing done. And who are they? And I found them. It turned out that Jamie was talking about rich people. In a Forbes article from 2017, He says, everywhere we went, speaking and presenting to leaders and their high-performing organizations at events and conferences, 
it seemed like thousands of people were all having the same conversation at the intersection of state changing tech and performance and innovation. From TED to Davos to Burning Man to Necker Island to the UN, these same influencers were making the rounds on a global circuit and using shared ecstatic experience to forge connections, build companies, and launch social movements. And this makes sense considering who Jamie's used to working with. Take a look at this bio, for instance. Mr. Wheel has advised members of the United States Navy Special Operations, top-ranked athletes and executives of technology companies on optimizing performance through flow, receiving six-figure fees for some of his consultations. His five-day retreat at a sprawling, privately held property known as Summit and convened the day before the solar eclipse cost almost $5,000. Attendees were housed in white TB-like tents with portable toilets set up down a dirt path. The camp had been erected quickly by the glamping company EtherCamp to Mr. Wheel's specifications. Rich folks. So I followed the thread to Davos, which is how I discovered Lucian Tarnowski. And I'll share a bit of his blog post uh, about Davos. He writes, the week before the World Economic Forum's annual meeting, Sivana, which is his new organization, hosted a salon for 20 Davos attendees in order to come up with a further list of potential golden memes. I then asked and received a great deal of feedback from my community. Through this process, I was able to fine tune the list into what I called the 10 golden memes. A special mention goes to Jamie Wheel, author of Stealing Fire and creator of the Flow Genome Project, for his invaluable feedback on how to package a meme for maximum impact. And then a bit further down, describing the actual time at Davos, he writes, last Wednesday, we then hosted a party called Remember 2030 in Davos Block Base and had over 500 people register. It was a full house all night, and we had the largest cacao ceremony in the 50-year history of Davos. We invited guests to attend as their best projected future selves in 2030, having achieved the Sustainable Development Goals. We invited them to celebrate the completion of the Golden Decade and the new planetary civilization. These included people such as Rick Doblin, the founder of MAPS, or the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And then he includes a quote from Tim Wu writing about the event. At an event entitled 2030, Lucian Tarnowski and his cohort predicted a new golden age of human thriving following various radical changes, such as the overcoming of material wants and a broader use of psychedelics for, mental, or for emotional health. And in an official nod to the revolutionary spirit, the World Economic Forum itself, the institution which runs the show, released a new Davos Manifesto for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. So the folks at the top of the current economic system are going to be trying to radically transform that system. So we'll take a look now at a few clips of Lucian presenting his ideas, and then I will question some of those. <laughs> so what is new at Brave New? So it's been a good year. Uh, we're taking on a number of new clients and we're powering knowledge sharing communities for organizations now like um, um, Lockheed Martin, Genentech, Mercer, GE, mm -hmm. companies like that and foundations are really helping activate collective intelligence. So helping people be smarter, sharing knowledge more effectively and creating these really powerful communities for change. So tell me how does that, do you see that we've seen people acting in the interest of the collective here in Davos? You've been coming for a while. So this is a really interesting point. It's, it's my ninth year here. And I think, um, I like to think of an Einstein quote uh, where he said, um, no problem can be solved with the same level of consciousness that created it. I think it's a very valid question here is, are, are, are the people trying to solve the problems here are they disqualified from doing so by virtue of their position in the system? Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting challenge of, of where, where is the new paradigm coming from? I'm very interested in the whole consciousness movement where you know, the big shift as I see it is people are, um, 
appro approaching the problems as a collective as opposed to a set of individuals. Mm -hmm. It's all about, in my eyes, um, surrendering the ego mm -hmm. for the interest of the collective. And I think that's a big question here is, you know, who, who, who's gaining at, at the end of the day and how are the organizations working together to solve these problems? Because they're all of our problems and, and it's inter interdependent and interconnected. And all too often, people are working in silos and, and they're not sharing best practices, they're mm -hmm. not collaborating. And I think that's, that's really why I think so often we're tweaking the problems rather than actually fundamentally shifting them. So once you have a model, you can scale that model to any global challenge. And so our thinking is let's get started in the area we know, but let's have a, let's have a, a playbook that we can just repeat. Um, and think of it almost like a, an X Prize meets World Economic Forum meets Hive Mind mm -hmm. is, is how we're thinking about it. This desire to be the saviors and find this scaled universal global solution is the very kind of impulse that um, Doug was critiquing in the Rebel Wisdom conversation. Rather than just doing something, they want to create the website that aggregates all the people who are then doing that thing, or the website that aggregates the websites that are aggregating. Everyone wants to, you know, become the thing. And I understand if you don't have the million people on Twitter saying, yeah, it feels like it hasn't happened, but that's such a, um, that's such a, a, a silly road to go down. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it, it, and it, it's so much easier to find gratification and, and to see the, the results of what you're doing when it's the, you know, the smile on the kid that you've taught to read or, you know, the, 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 the land that you've replenished, you know, it's just, it's so much, there, there's so much real work to be done. Lucian definitely didn't make his personal fortune by teaching kids to read or replenishing land. He comes from the European aristocracy and his organization Brave New and Brave New Talent arguably aim to facilitate the kind of contingent workforce that disempowers people from being able to live stable lives, let alone organize for systemic change. For example, take a, a look at this post from recruitingunblog.wordpress.com. The author writes, there's a new world of work coming. There's no doubt that work is moving to the contingent model with people bringing in skills for the short term, completing projects and moving on. Jobs have changed and so have their requirements. The skills an employee, employer needs now, they won't need in the future. The shift to the knowledge sector has created a recruiting problem. The difference between a contingent workforce and a permanent workforce is that new hires need all the skills required in the job now, rather than the potential to develop in the future. There's also less concern for long-term fit. Work is temporary and immediate. This changes the requirements on both sides. Hiring will become less about fit, potential, and experience, and more about current capability. Yesterday, I got to take a look at the new developments on community platform Brave New Talent and to talk about where the product is going. I knew it had taken a few years for the platform to take shape, but last year's investment has seen founder Lucian Tarnowski going on a hiring spree, concentrating on developers and programmers to build in new functions. The useful bit in Brave New Talent is the matching of people and employers by skills within the contingent economy. They are about skills, skills communities, skills connections, and skills profiles, perfect for the new world of work. Having been featured as the lead story on TechCrunch on Friday, following Tar Tarnowski's talk at Davos, all eyes are on the platform to see what is coming next from the talented network. So. This is his background, and still he feels like he is positioned to be the change. <laughs> Lucien is, of course, the found, now the founding curator of Savannah Foundation and House. Yeah. So tell me, first of all, what's going on there? What are you doing? So it's been a big year. We, um, we took on the um, very iconic house in San Francisco that was built by the creator of the Golden Gate Bridge. Hmm. And what we're doing there is we're prototyping what we kind of playfully call a planetary embassy. Mm -hmm. So it's all about bringing together what I love to call the transition team. People right. that are really motivated and ready to show up around this systems change we're in, this mm -hmm. kind of civilizational crescendo. 
together. To do what? So w ranges. A lot of it is um, starts with our own internal work. Mm -hmm. um, by doing our personal transformation, I think mm -hmm. we're best prepared for our collective thriving. Mm -hmm. And so we do salons, we do immersions, we do dinners. We have a 60-person dining room table. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, so words are powerful. You know, words can either be swords or they can be spells. Mm. And, and language, I think, shapes our culture. It shapes our identity. It shapes who we are. Mm -hmm. And so what we thought this year was to try an experiment to ask um, you know, the three and a half thousand people that are on all the social channels here in Davos to start spreading these positive ideas about the future. Mm. Ten golden memes. Um, most people have a really um, negative view of the future. You know, mm. to, to quote the Edelman Trust, Trust Barometer, Barometer last year, uh, that is a global survey and it showed that four out of five people believe the current system's broken. Mm. And so what we're doing is we, we, we looked at history and we were like, Whenever there were these times of change, mm. people would organize into trusted groups where they had to make oaths on their honor for their life. Mm. You know, that you had the Knights Templar, you had the Masons, and albeit these were power structures at the time, but these were groups that met regularly in person. And so what we're doing with Savannah House and then supporting digitally is gathering together people locally in the Bay Area to test this, to say what what would it look like to bring people into a civic oath, mm -hmm. into a deep trusted bond, like a brotherhood, sisterhood with each other? Mm. Um, and from there, can we establish the trust and the collective intelligence that would allow us to become our best selves, our, our reach our collective potential? And we think these this like idea of a planetary embassy, it's kind of obvious that we should have the equivalent of like Masonic lodges right. in every major city in the world that brings the smartest, the most committed people, those noble of heart, together around the oldest technology there is, the dining room table, mm. to, to say, how do we tackle, how do we deliver on the promise of this golden decade? All right, so are you looking for partners in other cities? What are you looking for? So right now, so I, I, I would say 2020 is the year of hindsight. Mm -hmm. So we're doing lots of experiments. We kind mm -hmm. of think of the space as an immersive experience game. Mm -hmm. So Ram Das talked about this. When you step over the threshold into the space, it's a 7,000 square foot space. When you step over that threshold, there's new game rules. And what we're doing is we're experimenting with those game rules and trying to establish the culture. And once we've got that established, we really think we can roll these out as a membership alliance, mm -hmm. as like a global alliance mm -hmm. of people deeply committed to social change around mm -hmm. the world. Um, in cities around the world, I think we can partner with city mayors, mm -hmm. we can partner with um, all sorts of companies that want to be part of the solution, not mm -hmm. the problem, you know, because it's like transformative innovation is what we've got to be doing. So join the Rebel Alliance <laughs> at Savannah Foundation, use the memes, and I look forward to seeing you again all throughout this golden decade, Lucien. Thanks Thank you. very much. Due to COVID, some of the Savannah House salons have moved online. And I was able to see a sample salon that happened a few weeks ago uh, where the participants were aiming to create a unanimous charter that for social change that everyone could kind of get behind and to, to fuel this movement of solidarity. But again, a lot of the people there were entrepreneurs. So I'm just gonna first show a clip of the dynamic because I find it, I found it very conspicuous the ways that the, the call was actually not a sort of round table experience where everybody was equally democratically um, active. We had Lucian who is definitely taking on this like leader role in the call and Ram who I was not another person I was not familiar with before listening to this but it was very much led by those figures and I just wanted to show the choice of long table for those that were the insider group at Savannah House with catered meal because there could have been choices to do things differently there could have been you know the people that were there using their own devices and you know operating independently but it was very much that the savannah house with with uh, Lucian at the the head or closest to the the camera to me that had a very noticeable impact on the the vibe of the conversation i would love to call on um amandine 
who has stayed up until what, like four in the morning, Amandine? Hi, Lucien. Hi, everybody. So good to see all of you again. Thank you so much, Amandine, for being here. Your commitment, commitment to the effort is always noted. <laughs> I'm going to skip forward now to some pretty powerful testimony from um, Sarah Murray. I'm not going to include her whole statement, but um, she described her father's role in reforming police after the late 60s race riots in Washington, D.C. And she noted that even though he really tried hard to do the right thing and create a, a positive police force, recent events have shown that those efforts were not strong enough, those good intentions were not enough to reform systemic problems. So I felt like that was a very valid point to make, and I'll, I'll show her and then I'm going to go into um, some of the responses. You know, the other thing that I want to say is that it's, it's a great, and I, and I say this with deep respect for Ram and everybody here, it's a great thing to write a manifesto about coming together, but in the life that we live in now in our complex society, the challenge that we all face is that we have to downshift from our own egos and our own roles and our own conceptions of ourselves into, into being different people to be able to connect together in a different way in a simpler form of society. And so the manifesto can't just be about the world that we want to create out there. It has to be about the work that we have to do internally to change ourselves and to change who we are willing to be in relationship to this new world that we have to create. And that's what I don't see in the document. And I, that's what I don't see in the work that people are being called to do. And you want to ask how to bring people together. But the way we bring people together is in the work that we're doing on each other that we have to rely on each other to help us to carry out. Sarah's response here came after a comment about, you know, what questions aren't being asked, who isn't part of this conversation. And so when you combine vo both Sarah's comments with that earlier context, to me, listening to the conversation, the response from both Ram and Lucian registered as kind of odd because they don't seem to ask, is there something about this idea that we haven't considered? They jump straight into, oh, we've already considered this, we already know this. And I find it ironic because in one sense, there is this kind of defensiveness bubbling up and that is precisely the sort of desire to be at the center, this desire to be the one who gets the badge for doing the great organizational work and scaling it for the you know, planetary civilization. That desire is potentially part of the problem here. And so that's the piece that's being missed between this comment and the responses. And so that is my response with all the appreciation and gratitude for everything that's, that's been because... done. There's uh, one of the charters here says, we, the unified people of the earth, commit to doing our own self-work, removing prejudices and attitudes that stem from a worldview of separation. We commit yeah. to these ancestral wounds individually and collectively, recognizing that this is the first step to creating a healthy society. So but, I would say I that's, yeah, in, I, you may not have words or I, language. I don't think it's just about removing prejudice and biases towards others. I think it's about changing our own identities within ourselves. And I think that's a different task I think it's a very different task. So it's not out there. It, it's, you know, we have identities created within the complex societies in which we live to which we're attached and that give us our value. And we have to be willing to let go of those things. And so the, the, the extent to which we have to let go, not just of our view of others, but our view of ourselves is very deep. And I don't see it reflected in that document. And that's that's my feedback and people can agree with it or not, but that's- Sarah, th thank, thank you so much for that. And and you just continue to be such a um, fountain of wisdom <laughs> with everything. <clears throat> I really appreciate you. And would love also for you to share what's happening on, the, on, on June 19th, um, because I think it's utterly beautiful and symbolic. Um, but as uh, just, just in a, a reflection, we spoke, um, we spoke last week about this point and even more, more specifically bringing out the four elements that, that Ram starts with. And the fifth element that, that I think we can create a whole meme around the fifth element and the fifth dimension as um, Amandine spoke to, um, but the fifth element being community. And that, that um, Maslow got it wrong that like 
we don't just go up the pyramid, but the, the backbone, the spine of the, our hierarchy of needs is community, which changes at each level as you, as you, um, as more and more of your material needs are met and you move into your spiritual needs, your, your, your need for community changes. And so thinking about uh, reframing from an identity perspective, reframing our relationship to community, because we're all drunk and deeply conditioned on individualism, more so than more so than I think we're aware of. The age of the lone wolf has been, you know, dawned since Descartes, and like we've been we've been in our mind and we've had our umbilical cord collectively cut. And so the question of how we come back in right relationship with each other well, with ourselves and with each other and with with our communities with the planet and ultimately with the cosmos can be that fifth element and we can frame community as starting with the relationship with yourself and going all the way up the the kind of full community fractal all the way up to your relationship with the cosmos itself and and, and that one and the same and, and that seems to me like a really powerful, like fifth element the kind of concept to bring in um, ri through ritual as well. So thank you so much, Aaron. I'd love for you just to share, because um, I think this could be something that's done in multiple places right now as a response to this moment. And it could be coincidental, but <laughs> to me watching it, it seemed that the woman who spoke afterwards could have been commenting on the sort of baked in irony of the situation because she goes on to talk about essentially spiritual bypassing and the importance of humility and kind of questioning motives, et cetera, which seemed to not be fully happening in what I saw right before. Those of us who are on a spiritual journey often encounter a great pitfall which I learned as a pre, as something called a premature spiritual leap. By my own experience throughout the years, often that just when I'm at my highest level of connectedness, the new universe will show me something that would humble me to show me the wounds that are still there. Thank you for that beautiful beautiful moment we all share together. To me, it seemed like Lucian in particular was more focused on the beauty of the spiritual moment rather than the call to humility and asking the really hard questions. So as part of what I would recommend would be an education in the work of Anand Jirodas, who wrote the book Winners Take All and recently started his own vice uh, channel show. So um, yeah, I'll show a few clips from him that relate to the situation. It began to occur to me that these people flying to Aspen, rich and powerful people, business people, executives at banks and tech companies and other things, flying to Aspen to talk about making the world better, changing the world, making a difference, giving back, they were the reason we had so many of our biggest problems in America in the first place, right? They were flying in from causing the problems back there and flying to Aspen to talk about solving the problems they had caused, right? And so in some small ways, I began to raise questions. We had a Goldman Sachs presentation to us about all their social justice work. Your viewers may not know, Goldman Sachs is apparently a social justice company. Who knew? I always thought they were a bank. So now, everything I just said is an analysis that is missing from a lot of these discussions, okay? We start where I ended. So now we start with, well, all these rich people have this money, we have all these social problems, and government is terrible, so at least rich people are doing something. No, no, no. You have to tell the whole story I just told. Rich people are the reason we have these problems and the government is incapable. And then they step on the scene and complain about the situation that their class caused and present themselves as the solution to the situation they have engendered, which is sort of like arsonists showing up at the site of a burning building and claiming to be the most capable firefighters. Plutocrats 
create a kind of ruling class ideology that upholds their power. And I believe that we need to see through this ideology, and I wrote the book to try to wake people up from it. The idea of win-win is has become a very crucial um, gospel of this market world religion. And what win-win-ism says is that it is possible to fight for the least among us. It is possible to fight inequality, reduce poverty, without hurting those on top. In fact, in ways that enrich and create profit for those on top, right? Now, this is an amazing promise. I mean, what a notion, right? If you apply this to other domains, you say, wow, we can empower women in ways that will increase men's power? Wow, that's, how do you do that? Wow, we can, we can end slavery in ways that will make white plantation owners even richer than they were before? Wow, I mean, it's, what a great promise. Sounds wonderful, right? Well, it's a lie. Uh, it's a lie. We have forgotten the tool of policy. We think that rich people and entrepreneurs are how you make change. We actually know how to change the world. It's when we act together through our shared democratic institutions. But we have been in the grips of this religion. Our societies are being defrauded by entrepreneurs who steal the language of revolution and of so social solidarity to undermine so solidarity, okay? So Mark Zuckerberg talks endlessly about community. Community, community, community. You know what's a really good kind of community? Democracy, one that he has undermined in Britain and the United States through data abuse, through allowing the Russians to commit cyber war in an American election, doing nothing about it because he didn't want his company's growth to be checked or regulated. Um, Mark Zuckerberg doesn't belong on the cover of magazines. He belongs behind bars, in my view. I, I don't understand how many people from my neighborhood in Brooklyn are in jail for smoking marijuana, and Mark Zuckerberg, for selling out an entire American election, is still running a big company. I, I just, I'm confused by it. If anybody, if anybody understands this, like, text me. There's this big fantasy that came out of Davos and other things, the multi-stakeholder approach. Like, let's business and government sit together and hash things out. Well, think about what this actually means. When you have multi-stakeholder approach, when you have these public-private partnerships, which are very fashionable now, you are creating a rich man's veto. A lot of rich people that I write about are happier to give $10 million to a foundation than to give $5 million in taxes. That's kind of interesting. So it's not entirely about keeping your money. A lot of them are giving away their money. So what's the difference? Why do they prefer philanthropy over taxation? And the reason has to do with credit and control. When you pay your taxes, you don't get credit. You're just complying with the law. When you do philanthropy, you get credit and control. Your name goes on the building, everybody knows you did it. It helps your reputation. If your pharmaceutical company killed people, if your chemical company poisoned someone's river, it helps your reputation because that was bad and now you're doing something good. Um, and you also get control, right? You get to decide. Let's give money to that school, not this school. Let's fund this program, not that program. And Credit and control are both things that rich people like. What the plutocrats is, have done is what every ruling class does throughout history, which is spin a set of ideas that justify their rule. You know, kings and queens did it in Europe. When you had kings and queens in power, suddenly you had philosophers talking about why kings and queens should be in power. When you had feudal lords in charge, you suddenly had some court philosophers talking about why feudal lords is the natural order of mankind according to the Bible. In our time, um, there has been this belief that, that rich people can save us. So the reason I'm ultimately here today is right now I'm seeing a pretty self-enclosed ecosystem of psychedelic slash IDW thinkers that are essentially the court philosophers for this new kind of capitalist elite to be able to seize psychedelics as a way for changing society 
patting themselves on the back for for going in that direction and ultimately maintaining the power imbalances that underlie the status quo. And so I'm pretty shy. I don't really like to, it's hard for me to speak publicly sometimes, but I feel like there needs to be some pushback because psychedelics can be a powerful tool in dismantling ideology and kind of helping people to see the way that things could be different. But right now, the loudest, most articulate, sincerest sounding voices are concerned with the well-being of the powerful and the wealthy. And so I just wanted to push back on that and kind of raise some questions about and also point out that there is there are other communities out there who are not interested in some universal charter for everyone to come together, but who are looking to find the others to find the people who care about dismantling systems of oppression. The wealthy elite in the psychedelic sense are ultimately running with a kind of narrative wherein their privileged position is justified because they are the most equipped to deal with the situation on the ground. But that that is a mythology, this idea that these people who got to where they are not on the basis of any kind of particular talent, but because of where they came from, who they knew, who their parents were, the idea that somehow we need to buy into that those are the people who are going to be our saviors and that we can just come up with a better code of ethics for interpersonal relationships and for the operation of corporations to change things is something I fundamentally reject. So if you're interested in these kinds of ideas and would like to see more, I recommend checking out Symposia. I'll link to that. We have a podcast called Plus Three. And as a bunch of scrappy poor kids, we're ultimately running on the fumes of our passion. So if you do want to help us out, we have a Patreon that I will also link to below. So thanks so much. This is my first kind of foray into video essay type thing. I'm a now unemployed academic. If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe. And I hope to see you again.